All right, now I'm going to be reading pages 58 to 63, 65. Let's see what we find out about Jason now. All right. Jason brings two large blocks to the storyroom every day now and builds a heliport. He changed the name at Edward's bidding. Call it a heliport, Jason. A airport. No, it isn't, Jason. Say heliport if you want to be the right way. Heliport. Okay, now you got it. Edward gives Jason a heavy-handed pat on the back. Jason does not like to be touched by the children, but he takes the friendly smack and stride along with the new label. Actually, Jason has used heliport before, but his acceptance of the term at this point is clearly intended to please Edward. The fact is, Jason is listening more carefully to the words children use as they play. They are all words he knows, but he hears them now in a new social con context, and they have a deeper meaning. In so doing, he enlarges his repertoire of responses each day beyond his fixed helicopter rituals. Call it tornado, Alex tells Simon. I'm Superman, and you're Superman Tornado. No, I'm a squirrel that turned into Superman Tornado. The boys have begun to build less than three feet from Jason's heliport. Don't touch my heliport, Jason has said three times. Don't tornado this place, he adds. This is the ice castle. It don't touch nothing or it could kill you. You know what, Simon? Superman doesn't need a door. He flies up, right? Watch out. Water with sharks. The sharks don't eat Superman. Samantha runs up. Look, you guys, I have a bunny that I can turn into anything I like. We're playing Superman. So what? I'm She-Ra. Hey, Jason. I need that block for my castle. I'm using it, he screams. It's my tornado block. Just give me one and I'll be your friend, okay? Okay, Jason replies. Thanks, Mr. Tornado Block. Samantha does nothing more to prove she's a friend, but Jason watches her curiously. This may be the first time in class someone had, has uttered those magic words to him. I'll be your friend. Don't put Crystal Castle near here, Samantha, Alex says. We're playing dark side. He'll kill you. He aims a thumb and forefinger at Mirka, who has just joined Samantha in Crystal Castle with a supply of pillows and blankets. Wait a minute. She's a Wonder Woman, Samantha yells. You don't bang at Wonder Woman. So what? You're under arrest. Let's get out of here, men. Trouble in West End. The boys scramble out of the ice castle and run toward the cubby room. No running, I call out between words on the story paper. And the boys slow down to a fast walk until out of sight. Jason sits down at the story table and tells me, You don't bang at Wonder Woman because she's good. I don't know. Let's ask Samantha. Samantha, why do people not bang at Wonder Woman? Because she's magic. No one can kill her. Jason, I asked, do you know anything that's magic? No, he twirls his blades. Their tornado is magic. The one Joseph was playing, my tornado block. I made a tornado block. A tornado block. It's still in my airport. Tornado airport. I write down tornado on the list of words and phrases that constitute Jason's spontaneous progress report. I need something to cut this, Jason says. Here's a scissors. What are you cutting? Something that kills me. What do you call it? Something that kills me. He cuts a long strip. This is what I'm cutting. It's just a helicopter blade, Jason, Katie says, scribbling on her wolf pitcher to make the wolf smoked out and squished up. She has just told another of her three pig stories in which the wolf blows down the house houses and the mother pig re rebuilds them it's something that kills me jason repeats are you thinking about joseph banging at people i'm thinking about a tunnel a big airplane is parked on the tunnel he brings a large curved wooden shape and stands it on the story paper this is my story i can't write the words if the tunnel is on the paper can you move it it can't move hold it over the paper until i finish then put it down again he lifts the tunnel Barely high enough for me to move the pen along. A big airplane. It's such a big one, you haven't believe it. Now, he takes my pen and draws a line across the paper. Jet stream. Oh, this thing that kills me turned into a blade. Get in there, blade, under the tunnel. Jason is playing inside a story. My intention, of course, is that every story he'd be played in. But Jason plays in his on. Jason plays in his on the paper. He'll use the story room to act a scene, but he can't visualize linearly. 
I'm busy falling. Pick. Have me something. Have some. Have me someone doing that. You want someone falling down, going. He wants a bad guy. Joseph explains, like in my story, falling down dead. Is that so, Jason? Um, he nods and falls again. Is it you? Are you bad guy? Jason continues to fall each time, taking a harder bump. Stop, Jason. Your story is over. Don't bump your head like that. I always do that, he says. It's not a good idea. You're getting a mark on your forehead. I take his hand and walk him to his seat. It's Katie's turn, Jason. Come on, sit in the heliport. The image of a jail door banging shut flashes before me. Did I encourage the story room heliport in order to contain Jason? If so, the solution will be short-lived. Perhaps even now he sees himself as a bad guy because he's surrounded by walls. Katie bounds onto the stage. No helicopters, no falling, no nothing, Jason, if I don't say it. He falls down one last time, knocking over his heliport wall. But he stands up again quickly and says to himself, something that would kill me. Katie hops around, waving her arms at Jason. His behavior has excited her. I read through the story quickly, and the wolf blows the houses down. Wait, he blows them down again, she shrieks. Joseph has to keep blowing it down, and I keep falling, and then I put it back, and then you blow it down, and she's giddy with inspiration. Joseph joins her in tumbling around the room. Make the chimney. Get the pot. Does Jason realize that his behavior has triggered this scene? His impulsive falling, falling down and jumping up has led directly to Kate's, Katie's image of a wolf repeatedly blowing down the pig's house while their mother puts the house back together. Katie, the controlled and reasonable mother, sees enough logic in Jason's actions to apply them to her own. Once again, it is the children who explain Jason to me. They find his eccentricities understandable and not at all strange. What is wrong with twirling and fixing your blades or falling down if this is part of your act? You're supposed to be as ostentatiously dramatic as you can be at all times, so say the children by their own actions. Furthermore, these same children who argue so ferociously over the equal distribution of blocks and cookies and pink paint defend a classmate's right to display unusual characteristics and make inconvenient demands. The children's concept of fairness is not limited by conformity. They want the equal opportunity to demand special treatment. It's unclear for Jason. It is unfair for Jason to disrupt a story, but he has the right to be the only one who builds a story room heliport. The adult objective, what if everyone decides, objection, what if everyone decides to become a helicopter and build a heliport? But the children know this never happens. Uh, um, the classroom doesn't need two helicopters. True, a rush of helicopters could occur, but they would quickly fade, leaving the one true pretender. Why do you always bring a helicopter, the children asked Jason in the beginning. The blade is broken and I have to fix it. This was considered a sensible answer by all, except me. I see my role more clearly now to discover which of Jason's responses are deemed sensible by the children while observing which of our responses seem logical to Jason. Someone's hiding in my airport, Jason says, pointing to Simon. No, I'm not in there. Simon's in my airport. You're lying, you duty head. Simon's in my airport. Don't say my name. Tell him not to, teacher. Jason, Simon doesn't want you to pretend he's in your airport. Do you want him to come in? Really come in? No. Jason is not being sensible. And the children refuse to accommodate him. No one offers to come into his house or to allow him to pretend they are hiding in there. Is Jason trying to invite Simon in or is he teasing? Jason, can I help you find someone to play inside your airport? Teachers do that, you know. Once I helped Simon find a mother squirrel. Remember, Simon? I don't want a mother squirrel, Jason says. Who do you want? Someone hiding in my airport. Okay, listen, everyone. Jason needs someone to hide in the airport. Who will do that? Only if I can be a mother, Samantha says. It's a helicopter house. I'll be the mother and you're the baby. No, I'm She-Ra and you're the helicopter. Yes, Samantha enters gingerly and sits down next to Jason, who says, My blades are broken. I'm fixing them. We have to make beds. I'll get the pillow. I'll save my place. Jason covers Samantha's place with one hand and blows on the helicopter blades. Turn around. Turn around. Ooh, ooh, not such a good spinning. Kick the house down. Kick the house down. <laughs> Samantha returns with the bedding. Lie down, little helicopter, she says, making Jason into a baby as delicately as she can. Kick the house down. Shh, shh. 
shh, little helicopter. If si Samantha has tricked Jason into being a baby, it is no less than Jason attempted to do with Simon. But she uses finesse. There is much to learn about play when you don't come to it easily. Jason does not understand the play of other children, but they seem to know what he is playing. Luckily, he repeats his misconceptions and continues to act them out so that we can see them and react to them. There's a helicopter. They did not make such a good spinning. Then some things were blowing and it puffed the flying thing to a good place. The end. Was something wrong with the helicopter? Why didn't it make such a good spinning, Jason? Because there's a lot of too many people in the air. Oh, it was too crowded, by the way, Jason. Did the block seem too crowded to you before? No, I wondered because you were saying kick the house down. Because the helicopter didn't spin. Were you worried because Samantha was the mother? Well, anyway, I'm glad you let Samantha in. Well, then the helicopter couldn't make a good spinning. Anyway, I'm glad you let Samantha in. Why are you? Because it made her happy. That's why. Soon I will have even more reason to feel glad, for with his simple mother-baby episode, Samantha launches a wholehearted pursuit of Jason that more than any other event in the school year brings him out of the helicopter house and into the social life of the classroom. Samantha is determined to make Jason her baby, and despite his protestations and rituals in the end, she succeeds. Which is not to say she has the last word in his affairs. A boy who would be a helicopter enters society in full control of his vehicle.